Okay, we're going to talk about deep hip rotator muscles and answer the questions, what are the deep hip rotators and what are their actions and what help do they provide when walking? Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Morton and I am the noted anatomist. So to do some orientation, the deep, deep hip rotator muscles, this is a right hip joint in a posterior view and there's a gluteus maximus and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go shing and shing and make those incisions and then I'm going to take the gluteus medius right by that iliac crest and make those two incisions and that is what we're going to get and there's our gluteus minimus muscles. So our three gluteal muscles help give some framing and orientation but we're going to focus on the piriformis, the superior gemellus, obturator internus, inferior gemellus quadratus femoris and obturator externus on the other side. Those are the muscles we're focusing on, okay, using this picture. And those are the muscles. Let's start with our piriformis muscles. And there's our piriformis muscle, piriformis muscle, which is Latin for pear-shaped because it kind of looks like a pear. And the piriformis muscle arises from the ventral surface of the sacrum within the pelvic cavity, right by those sacral foramina. And then it courses through the greater sciatic notch. And as a matter of fact, it fills most of the space of the greater sciatic notch, even though the sciatic nerve goes through it, the piriformis fills most of the space. And then after going through the greater sciatic notch, you see it going to behind the hip joint and inserting on the top of the greater trochanter of the femur. For surface anatomy, the piriformis plays an important um, part. So to find it, we find this dimple. That's the dimple the next time you get out of the shower and you turn and look on the backside in all your glory, you're gonna see a little dimple on here in the back. That's where the post posterior superior iliac spine is located. And then draw an imaginary line all the way down to the top of the greater trochanter of the femur. And you'll notice when you make that imaginary line, it's showing the top of the piriformis muscle. And if you know where that is, it helps give you some orientation where some important nerves are to avoid them if you're going to make in, uh, injections. So here is our piriformis muscle, and coming above the piriformis is the superior gluteal vein artery and nerve, and below the piriformis are the inferior gluteal vein artery and nerve. The gluteal vessels and nerves are named for where they are, uh, exit the pelvis in relation to the piriformis. But in addition, shing, there's a huge sciatic nerve that as it enters the back of the thigh, it goes below the piriformis muscle. When the piriformis compresses it, that's one of a number of things that can give someone uh, sciatica and they call it piriformis syndrome. <clears throat> now the superior gemellus muscle is this next one. It's the one in turquoise and it arises from the ischial spine and it in inserts on the greater trochanter of the femur. Then we have the obturator internus, and there is that obturator internus that arises from the internal surface of the obturator membrane, the part inside the pelvis. So when we look at this hemisection of the pelvis from the right side, that obturator internus is all on the inside surface of the obturator membrane. And then it courses, and right below the ischial spine, it makes a 90 degree turn. So here's a posterior view of the right hip, and we've just rotated a little bit, so you can see the obturator internus comes up, and just below the ischial spine, shing, it makes that right-handed turn, and then it goes and inserts on the greater trochanter of the femur. Next is our inferior gemellus muscle that arises between the ischial spine and ischial tuberosity, and inserts on the greater trochanter of the femur. So these two gemellus muscles, superior gemellus and inferior gemellus muscles, uh, the term gemellus is Latin for twin. So you think of the way to remember this is the zodiac symbol for Gemini. Gets that name for twins for the Greek, uh, uh, in Greek mythology, Castor and Pollux, those two uh, twins. And in more contemporary terms, you got the... Uh, the Olsen twins. All right, so quadratus femoris is the next muscle, and it arises from the ischium or along the ischial tuberosity and inserts on the intertrochanteric crest, um, right by the greater trochanter on the back side. And it, quadratus femoris gets its name because the term quadratus is Latin for four sided, it's a four sided muscle. And the quadratus femoris is not to be confused with the quadriceps femoris, four headed muscle on the femur. And this one in the deep hip rotators is the four-sided muscle of the femur. Now the obturator externus, we're going to take the right hip, except we're going to take a look at it from an anterior view. And there we can see the obturator externus arising from the external surface of the obturator membrane. And then notice that the muscle belly courses posteriorly 
posterior to the neck of the femur before inserting to the greater trochanter. So it goes behind the neck of the femur, the behind the hip joint. This is why it's an external hip rotator as well. So the obturator externus is not topographically in the same location of the deep hip rotator muscles, but functionally it belongs there because it externally rotates the hip or external hip rotation. Topographically, obturator externus is really with the medial thigh compartment, which is like the adductor brevis longus and magnus and gracilis muscles. All right, so for innervation. Now, the innervation for deep hip rotator muscles are not as important clinically as other muscles are. But because I'm an anatomist and we name the crap out of everything, I don't know if you can hear my son Gabriel, he's singing in the background, um, then uh, I'm going to cover him because I'm an anatomist. So the piriformis muscle is innervated by the nerve to the piriformis muscle located here on the schematic of the sacral plexus. The next is the superior gemellus and obturator internus muscles. They are innervated by the nerve to the obturator internus. Basically, the obturator internus is innervated and you throw in the superior gemellus and it's located here in this diagram. Now, the obturator internus, even though it has the name obturator, is not innervated by the obturator nerve. So I just thought I'd throw that out just anatomically. Next is the, the inferior gemellus and quadratus femoris muscles are innervated by the nerve to the quadratus femoris. So it's innervated by. And now the obturator externus is innervated by the obturator nerve here, which is coming off of the lumbar plexus from L234. Um, so the obturator externus is innervated by the obturator nerve along with the medial thigh compartment, adductor brevis longus magnus gracilis, but the obturator internus is not. Okay, and then here's just a cool schematic from Mark Nielsen uh, who teaches at the University of Utah as well because a crazy, smart, amazing anatomist. And it meant to... I just thought I'd point that out. Guy's amazing. All right, so uh, common insertion for the deep hip rotators is that greater trochanter of the femur. And so when we look at this picture from Gray's Anatomy, it's a posterior view of the right femur. There, you can see the obturator externus insertion. There's the quadratus femoris insertion. Now, in an anterior view, there's the piriformis on the greater trochanter, and there's the obturator internus and the superior and inferior gemelli uh, muscles. Okay, greater, so the greater trochanter is a big attachment for the deep hip rotators. Now, the common action is this, chink, one more time, chink, and that is showing external hip rotation, okay? So in this superior view of the pelvis, that is showing this little schematic is the pelvis, and those are the two heads of the femur, and that red line is showing the deep hip rotators. So when you're standing, it does that movement. That is showing the external hip rotation like this. Now, what happens if we're now going to do external hip rotation during a walking gait when walking? So we're going to add the road there, and there's the fixed foot, the fixed limb. Okay, that's the one that's not going to be moving. That's the one that's planted when walking is going to occur. That is showing the ball and socket hip joint on the left side, showing the hip joint that will medially rotate during this walking gait. That is showing the swinging foot, which is the advancing free limb, and that dotted line is the line of advancement that we're going to use to help gauge how straight the foot is. So watch what happens if we take a step but do not do anything to the advancing hip joint. You see that? One more time. The foot is not parallel with the line of advancement. So, do you see that line? So, what do we need to do to the foot? What do we do to the foot? To, what do we do to put the foot <laughs> parallel with the line of advancement? We do that. That's external rotation of the hip. Okay, so let's follow that. You see this? And that's what happens when you walk, when that swinging foot walks. So on the fixed foot, you have internal rotation of the fixed hip. On the, ex on the swinging foot, the advancing foot, you have external rotation of that advancing hip like that. And that, my friends, is showing deep hip rotator muscles in a nutshell.